there's going to be opportunities you know the 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 people like i said the publishers who are going to drive the growth and the and the risk taking and all that stuff that will find its way downwards to people like us that you know and the opportunities will will find their way to to everyone and i think the industry will recover you know for the time being when you know the industry is recovering you know just you know crack a book build a game Go on your own. Find some friends that are in the same boat you are. Maybe go do something to keep a very small but highly skilled set of people, some of which are unemployed right now. And some of some people are lucky enough to still be employed. Mm-hmm. Um, we all need to pull together because the wave that comes after this. Hi, and welcome to a new episode with Brad Hendricks, a 25-year game industry veteran and founder and CEO of Blind Squirrel Entertainment. BSE is a AAA game studio that creates original content and provides full game dev services to various publishers and developers. Under his leadership, they've become a top collaborator for huge games like Disney Infinite 3.0, Bioshock Infinite, XCOM Enemy Unknown, Borderlands 2, Sunset Overdrive, Evolve, and others. Brad shares his journey of opening a studio 14 years ago, what it was like, and lots of practical advice in this episode. Let me know what you think in the comments, and click on the like and subscribe buttons if you find it helpful. Thanks. Hey, Brad. How you doing tonight? Great. How you doing? Doing pretty good. Thanks. Um, so what part of the world are you calling in from? I am currently in Austin, Texas, um, but we also have studios in Irvine, California, and Auckland, New Zealand. So we are wow. in three locations right now. Yeah, three very spread out locations. Yes. That's cool. So what's your current title and role at Blind Squirrel Games right now? So I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Blind Squirrel Games. We've been uh, in business for, geez, 14 and a half years now. So. Wow, that's impressive. Yeah, and I was looking at your background. I noticed that you had transitioned from emerging game technologies to yeah. Blind Squirrel in 2010. So, yes, what was kind of the the process behind that? Like, <laughs> well, it was it was more of a funny process, I guess. I mean, wh- you know, as you know, uh, Cambrio didn't did not last. Um, oh think they, yeah, Game Embryo. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. I remember the engine company. So. Yeah, a little egg yeah. or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were they were pretty. It's a good engine at the time. I mean, but you know, Unreal was you know, and Unity were starting to eat them up, and so they just sort of kind of went to the wayside. I think they're still around, but mm-hmm. I got pulled into <laughs> to my boss's office and said we were going out of business, and I had just gotten a call from somebody at 2K Games asking if I knew of any devs that could work on some of their projects. Mm-hmm. And I said, I didn't know anybody. I'd call them later if I found somebody. But after I got out of her room, I called them up and said, I know of some people. And uh, and I grabbed some engineer friends of mine and I said, we want to do this. And he goes, well, what's the name of the company? And I said, I haven't figured that out yet, but, um, <laughs> but uh, I can get somebody into Germany. And it was on Spec Ops. Uh, the line was the game, and oh. we ended up sending out engineers to uh, to Germany for for a few weeks uh, okay. to help them out. So that's how we got started. It was sort of just a train wreck at Gamebryo, and then I just said, you know what, I'm tired of working for someone else, and decided to start my own thing. Saw an opportunity and worked for hire, and took advantage of it, especially in the engineering side. So yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of studios. They start in the engineering side. Like I, I have friends over at Disbelief, yeah. uh, which the Steves, Anna Keeney and Elmore, and good friends of mine. I had Anna Keeney on the show, and you, you know, you just get some really smart engineers that can come yeah. in and fix problems. It's a great business model, right? So yeah, well, and I still the my um, the original my senior engineer, lead engineer, who's now my chief development officer, has been with me since that that time frame. Matthew Fawcett, he's great. So wow, you're great. absolutely right. Is engineering is what put us on the map? Absolutely, is how mm-hmm. we got to a reputation that then expanded. You know, right. So what do you, what do you wish you had known about the industry back when you had started? And I think it was at IGN, right? You were at GameSpy. Fox Interactive Media bought okay. MySpace and IGN, and IGN had just acquired GameSpy. And mm-hmm. so, obviously, you know, GameSpy was oh, sort yeah. of 
middleware technology, yep, yeah. you know, multiplayer, blah, blah, blah. PlayStation right. 2, roll your own. You know, we, we did that for Mortal Kombat Deception, I think it was. Yeah, when we went yeah. online. You know, That's kind of where it went. It goes back to your other question is, what did I wish I knew? I think, you know, the weird thing was is when I was a game spy and I was in charge of a group that we would go in and we would implement, you know, our the Unreal Tech, or sorry, the game spy technologies into whatever engine they were using. A lot of them were proprietary at the time. Yeah. Some of them weren't. Um, Renderware and, maybe or something. Yeah, yeah, and what I saw is a huge opportunity because, you know, it was re- really, really worth for hire, but we were using games by engineers to go in and, you know, integrate it into Grand Theft Auto or Battlefield or whatever, right? And yeah. that was my job role. And I saw huge potential because a lot of these game studios didn't have, um, they didn't want the skill set internally all the time. And they would rather mm-hmm. just hire to, for that need at the time. And so I saw a huge opportunity. And Unfortunately, GameSpy also kind of fell to the wayside uh, and were also sold off at one point. Um, yep. And you know, the, the person in charge didn't see the value and, and work for hire, which I was like, look. And that was sort of where I ended up going because I saw a huge potential, mm-hmm. uh, which is sort of where Blind Squirrel kind of was born out of. So it kind of they're kind of related to each other because that's sort of what I did with Gamebryo as well. Right? Yep. It was, you know, how do we get you guys to choose our engine to use in your tech? So. Right. You know, yeah, like evangelism and stuff. And like we that. would provide, you know, help for them to do the integrations and all that kind of stuff too. So. Yeah, yeah, and, and I'm just kind of flashing back because, like, when we were taking Mortal Kombat online, it was like Xbox had this whole infrastructure and and, and yeah. SDKs, and it's all yeah. right there. And then it was like Sony's like, eh, roll your own, man. Good luck. F- figure it out. Oh. We're like. What do yeah. we do? And we went to GameSpy, and I remember working with people at GameSpy and and getting updates and coordinating stuff and doing stuff late at night and and getting it to work so that we could have the PS2 version of MK online yeah. uh, in parallel with the Xbox. And um, yeah, it, it filled a need, right? Like it was it was good stuff at the time. It yeah, fun. it was. I mean, it was the only only game on the street to do that kind of stuff and storing data. You know, like player data for leaderboards and all mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. Nobody was doing it. And then obviously over time, Demonware and a lot of those guys came out and yeah. uh, and it became a lot more competitive and then commoditized, to be honest with you. Um, right. right, right. You know, Parody. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Driven by price and stuff. Um, so, you know, here, here's a question. Like, like, what kind of advice would you give someone looking for their first job? Here in 2024. Well, we all things. know. Yeah, we all know the state of the industry, don't we? <sighs> yeah, um, it's it's tough right now. Um, mm. You know, if it's a new person coming into the industry, you know, out of college or whatever, um, do, you know, don't give up. Right. <laughs> yeah. Don't ever give up. You know, I started out as a QA guy. I'm sure a lot of people did in our industry. You know, be well. willing to, yeah, 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 I did as well. And you got to start somewhere. And so just try to get your, yourself in the door. That's really important. And then you can evolve out and always want to take on more opportunities and roles within an organization. For those that are in the industry, um, you know, stay diligent. I think most of us agree that, that the industry is going to pull out of this, whatever you want to call it, a nosedive uh, in terms of resources <laughs> um, because it has to, um, you yeah. know, most of the companies that are, you know, that are driving a lot of the growth and shrinking or whatever is going on, they're all publicly traded companies. So they're going to have to find a way to pull out of this nose dive. Um, yeah. Our industry for years and years and years saw crazy growth until literally recently. As far as I can remember, I don't ever remember it being like it is today, right? In terms of yeah. next flat growth. So, you know, I, I, I believe that it's going to pull out, just stay diligent, you know, mm-hmm. um, you know, there's going to be opportunities, you know, the, the, the people, like I said, the publishers who are going to drive the growth and the, and the risk taking and all that stuff that will find its way downwards to people like us that, you know, and the opportunities will, will find their way to, to everyone. And I think the industry will recover. Um, it may take a little bit, but stay diligent. And now is the time, you know, is, 
start thinking outside of the box. You know, if you're a group of guys and you're like, nobody's hiring, then maybe start your own thing. It's kind of what happened to me. Maybe go for it. Right. You know, um, I know that's not the best paying job because typically no one's paying that bill, but go for it. If you think you got some great ideas, there's a lot of small publishers that are what I would say, small sm- smelling the blood in the water. And so right. there's a lot of real opportunity in that sort of sub $3 million kind of game dev market right now. And if you've got a great idea, go for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but other than that, you know, for those of you that have been industry veterans, you guys know what, what's going on. Stick with it. It'll improve. You'll find your way back in. Once you're in, just be ambidextrous, everyone. Just realize that you know, that you've got to stay diligent and you've got to be ambidextrous, which allows you to be wear a lot of different hats. That'll make you more valuable, I think, yeah. you, you know. Right. Yeah, yeah. And keep your skills up to date. And, yeah, you know, absolutely. I think for people in the industry now looking, you know, it's like, how do you improve your portfolio? How do you improve your resume? You know, all those kind of things yeah. that, that you need to do to, you know, to stand out because there are there are a lot of people looking, unfortunately, right? You know, it was like really talented yeah. people too. Yeah. Which is, yeah. I wish I had a huge project right now. There's so many good people right now that yeah, you me both. I would yeah. hire in a heartbeat. Like you know, everyone that's worked for me has been great. You know, and if I had this huge project right now, I'd bring them all back. You know, and then I'd find even better people, and you know, it'd be great. You know, but then again. Yeah. And anybody who's got money, just remember me. I'm right here. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. For co dev opportunities. So there you yeah. go. Yeah. Well, or, you know, yeah. full dev. That's kind of where we evolved to as a studio. So. Okay. So have you published full games yourself or, or yes. developed? Develop, yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So we, um, I think it's been two years now. We, we launched uh, Drifters Loot the Galaxy. We self published that. Um, that was a mistake, I think, just because, you know, we didn't know anything about self-publishing at the time. Um, we did our best. We hired some really good um, external third-party people to help us with publishing. And then they they did the best job that they could with the limited budget that we gave them. Yeah. Um, but self-publishing is difficult at best. Um, yeah. The game was good. You know, it was a 5v5, you know, hero action shooter game okay. with some unique mechanics. But, yeah, so we've shipped our own title. And right now we sort of evolved into um, licensing full, you know, games from reputable uh, licensees. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I can't talk about a lot of those right now because we're hoping at GamesCon next week we're going to be able to announce some of this stuff. But, um Oh, cool. But yeah, we're we're definitely a full dev shop. That's that's sort of our mission as a studio is to make sure that we maintain that full dev capability, so that you know that we can maintain the core of people that we have in yeah. our organization right now. Which yeah. uh, we've got some great people in our organization with thirty plus years, all of our leadership levels. So we're ready to do that kind of full dev sort of work. Um. So, you know, I'm always curious about the topic of change, right? And, and like how how people go through that. And, you, you know, thinking of yourself, like what's the biggest career change that that you've been through, right? Like like what? Me, personally? What yeah, you personally. Definitely becoming a CEO. Because I didn't, I mean, you know, who, who like goes to school? Like what's the CEO school? What, what is that? <laughs> right, right. CEO for game school. Can I sign up for that, please? Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, and I'm still learning every day. I mean, you're a fool if you don't think you're lear- not learning every day. I am. And, yeah. you know, I think that's been probably the most difficult because in the past I was, you know, a producer, an executive producer, I was building games. I was in the nuts and bolts of that. I was in, you know, I was in BD and, you know, and, Mm -hmm. you know, I guess that all those experiences all added up together to to allow me to be at least not a complete nincompoop CEO. (laughs) Um, But, you know, we all make mistakes. Um, I guess fail quickly, fail often. That's sort of been my motto. I guess that's also Elon Musk's motto, too. But Pixar, I think, yeah, Pixar was like fail fast or whatever. I think. Yeah, fail quickly, fail fast. You know, you know, whoever came up with it either way. But I'm sort of in that boat. You know, I think that that's been what I would say my most difficult transition. Um, but I think all the positions that I had before sort of lent themselves to, you know, what kind of a CEO I am, because I think there are different kinds, right? There's like yeah. 
You know what I mean? There's, you know, guys who are, you know, really into the the finance side, you know, and then there's guys who are really into the management side. And, you know, it, it just depends. And I think that, you know, the experiences I've had have really lent themselves to allow me to look at things in a good light, I think, is a good way to put it, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and I think sometimes like you have like bad role models too, right? Like, oh yeah, <laughs> like do the opposite of what that person is doing. Like when I've when had I, plenty, when, yeah, you know what I mean. Like, no, that's bad. Like, and yeah, I've had I've worked for some pretty terrible CEOs that didn't understand anything about games, and they just like, what's the difference? Ah, you know, like uh, yeah. there's Nabisco, the it's ESPN, whatever. You know, it's like yeah. you, you don't know what the hell you're doing. Um, I've had I've had those bosses too. I think you yeah. look at it, you know, as a learning experience as well. I mean, yes, they were horrible people, um, but you know, it taught me like, okay, don't don't be like that, right? Yeah, right. And it right. also taught me like, oh, I get it now why they acted like that, but you could have done it a different way, right? right? right I think right. that's probably the more epiphany of of things that I've learned, like, wow, I get why you did that, but now I, there's a better way to do that. You shouldn't right. have done it like that. You know what right. I mean? Right. Like, you know? yeah. Whereas before like, I was, yeah, yeah. like, I, before I, I was the, like, yeah, the position you were put in, yeah. right, right. I like, I see why you would do that, but, but, there's this other way and that's the way you should have gone. So yeah. like, I will understand why you did that. Oh, I not understand, but like, I can see why you did that, but I, I know it's wrong and you shouldn't do that. And um, yeah, there's a lot of, yeah. So like, what kind of doubts and concerns do you have to push through? Right. Like to, to do this, like, you know, where were you kind of like, you know, I think, you know, everybody, you know, who's running a company or in a, in a development team that's sort of in the original founding group, mm-hmm. you know, how do, how do you evolve as a studio? That's a really tough question. I think a lot of people either just like, I don't want to change and I want to stay. Like we could, right. I, if, if I didn't change, we'd be a powerhouse engineering studio, but I wouldn't know anything else because that was sort of what my background was is mm. working with engineers to help studios to do whatever right whatever yeah. maybe right and so um but i wanted to be more than that and the good thing is the people that i hired wanted to be more than that too and so we started adding you know the different you know uh disciplines within a, a studio art you know design production, you name Uh it, QA, you know, management, you know, the whole thing. Audio, yeah. Audio, you know, you know, you name it. So, and when we finally got to that size where we're, we're like a full development studio, Mm -hmm. um, it was really challenging to find the right people. And, and the hardest part was always finding the right management team. Um, but now, like I said, in, you know, in the beginning was, is I've got that team now, I've got the right people now. Yeah. Um, and I want to make sure they're always going to be part of my core team, my leadership team, if you will, mm-hmm. uh, moving forward. Cause it took years to get through that, finding the right guys that all have the same mindset, that all have the same work ethic and attitude and the same positive forward momentum. And everybody's trying to get to that same kind of thing, which is we wanted to be a full dev studio. We wanted to to do AAA level work, and we want to do it, um, you know, as 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 on time and on budget as as humanly possible. And right. that those are always those are tough, right? To do right, yeah. and right. and and a lot of people go out and they do that, and they say they want to do that, and then they they don't deliver on time or they don't deliver on budget, and then they get a reputation as not really performing. And so, luckily, we've had that right core people in our group now. And we do those things. And so we get the callbacks. And that's sort of the only way that you're going to, if you're going to make a choice to be that studio, you've got to make sure you you can fire on all cylinders. Right. And so, yeah. so I have that team now. So it's, it's been a struggle to find them. It took me, I'd say about of the four, you know, 14 years, it took me about seven, eight years to find those people, all of them, you know, I've had yeah. people in key positions with me in certain parts of our organization for mm-hmm. a long time, but not the full 14 years. Right. You know? Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. And people are, that's the key, right? Like, you know, people it, are it's everything. the people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah people are like, everything, you know, you have the technology, you're going to have whatever, but like you have to have the people and, and that's exactly. so, um, so critical. Um, yeah. So what kind of advice would you give someone who has fears and doubts right now around making a big change? Like, 
what would you tell yeah. her? You know, if you're if it's your dream, don't ever give up. You know, just bottom line, don't give up. Yeah. Um, the industry is weird right now, and in, in the West specifically, there is a lot of pressure in the West to price downwards, and that's very very scary and difficult. Mm. And so, you know, so we have to be diligent in the West as we, you know, for those, those, those developers that survive, um, you yeah. know, through this time period. And there's been a lot of them that haven't, um, you know, they have to retool themselves and we have to figure out how do we do what we used to do, you know, cheaper. So like I said in the beginning, you know, as yeah. a, if you're an artist, be willing to learn a lot of different ways to do what you used to do. Like there's a lot of different ways to do what you used to do, but figure out, you know, you know, maybe, you know, maybe managing is, is okay, or maybe managing external resources is okay, but just learn your trade, you know, learn as much as you possibly can, because in an organization, you're going to become more valuable um, that way. You mm -hmm. know, when, you know, a manager looks at you as like, Hey, you know, this person is super good. Like, I don't want to lose this person. That's where you want to get to. Right. And so, right. But, you know, for the time being, when, you know, the industry is recovering, you know, just, you know, crack a book, build a game, you know, go on your own, find yeah. some friends that are in the same boat. You are maybe go do something to keep your skills up, you know, um, keep an eye on our website because we'd love to hire you, you know, you, the, the people that are out there, they're, like I said, there's some really great people, um, mm -hmm. but stay with it. Don't give up. You know, no, we don't want our industry in the West. And when I mean the West, I mean the U S mm -hmm. you know, we don't want that to go away. We don't want the talent we have. We built an amazing industry in the U S with a super talented people. So stick with it. You know, everybody stick with it. We're going to be fine. Right. We're going to get, you know, so. Right, yeah, because there are challenges, especially costs related, like coming from you know Eastern Europe and Asia and stuff like yes. that. So, um, and, and I think you can provide the value, you know, in terms of skills and communication and time zone and all those kind of things. That are, are, that's the know. that's the beauty of where I think we are. Like the people that are left standing, right, right. when when the dust settles, there's going to be. There will be a huge demand for work for hire for new studios to start out there. And, you know, you know, there's going to be people are going to get sick of, you know, what I would say, the the, you know, the old kind of cookie cutter games that are coming out. They're going to want new ideas and new games to play. That's right. what consumers are going to want. You're starting to see that now. Um, and that's going to come from the people right now, probably that aren't employed. I guarantee you. Yeah. Uh, you know, because they're going to ones that are like, well, you know what? I've always wanted to do this thing. I wanted to build this game where I wanted to do this thing. And, and that's where those ideas are going to come out of is an advers adversity. You know, amazing things happen. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I, I do believe that that's where we're heading is that, you know, we're going to see a change in our industry. The West is going to survive. Um, you know, all by things will change. You know, I think that we're, you yeah. know, we're going to have to figure out how to solve those problems. But, but I do think that we're going to see some really interesting things coming out of the industry in the next three years, for sure. Cool. Big things. Yeah. Know? Yeah. And kind of, you know, riffing off that, like, what are you kind of curious about in the industry going on right now? Um, besides those things that we've talked about, like, well, I think, stands out? you know, if I was looking, if I'm looking at this in a, in a, in a very narrow window, I think right mm -hmm. now what's happening in the industry is like I said, there's a, there's a downward price pressure. Yeah. Uh, in terms of new IP, I think there's a lot of what I would say risk mitigation taking place at the top. And that means that if I'm going to fund game development, I want the game that I'm funding. If it's a new IP, mm -hmm. I need it to come with the built in audience. So I think licensed opportunities, meaning like if I was to go out and license Marvel or something like that, obviously that's, you know, really expensive, but let's yeah, just. Yeah. Right. Example, you know, that kind of stuff, licensing opportunities. That's what we're doing right now. We've managed to license a couple of things that, that I'm hoping that we can announce soon that um, are really cool licenses that uh, we believe are come in with a very sizable built in audience. And mm -hmm. I think that's where the publishers are gravitating towards right now is that they feel that this is less of a risk for me to invest in right now in that type of game development. And I think that'll evolve, right? And that'll yeah. still be a thing because it was always a thing. But um, I think it'll evolve where it'll be pure new IP in a couple of years um, where people are going to want that, 
you know, they're willing to take that risk. The publishers are, um, yeah. cause right now, if a game doesn't come with a built in audience, there, there are people that are very apprehensive about investing in that right now. Um, yeah. You know. Yeah. There's so many games out and there's so much competition and yeah, you know, I've talked about this on other shows about, you know, you're competing for people's time right like and, and there's yeah. so many other things and they can do in their dollars yeah. right but like you know I, I can spend the money and and do something else i can watch a movie i i, I can whatever right like there, there's there's so many yeah. things going on and, and people only have so much money and attention um yeah that it, you know it's not like it was 10 or 15 years ago so it's, um yeah it was even like five or six or seven years ago when we when the industry when when the economy would go through a recession, the games industry was like, woo right. Because we, the people, the first thing they do is they go play video games and start drinking, right? right? Yeah. So so our industry would, you know, our, all of, you know, we'd see our- recession industry, proof, well, right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, that's, things have changed, right? you know, and so, um, and we need to be wary of that, that, you know, yes, we may be slightly um, recession proof, but we also need a couple other- financial levers to be moved, which is the interest rates have to be low and we have to be yeah. going through a recession. And that was not what happened in the last couple of years. So, Hey, if you're finding this interesting, please click the like and subscribe button so the YouTube algorithms know and I can help spread the show. Thanks. So mm -hmm. now we know the cause, right? You know, yeah. generally. Um, but yeah, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and things change, you know, because during COVID, everyone had just more time to look at screens, and then you know the well, the industry went crazy. Like, you saw the, yeah. you know, oh, and God, then yeah. and then very next year, boom, right, right. And so, um, and so everyone's like, why, why is this happening? Um, you know, people weren't playing games. Well, you know, we were in a recession, but you know, the people were, you know, you know, the interest rates were collapsing, which means that the, the publishers and they invested crazily in all these acquisitions that were taking place. You know, that was right. You know, and so there's a lot of money being spent, not necessarily on game development, but on acquisitions within the development community. So you saw companies like Embracer and Tencent and all these people You're buying right, up, right. snapping up tons of people. Right. Um, Embracer is a poster child. But that. there wasn't yeah, a lot right. of content plays that yeah. were happening along with that. It wasn't like, okay, I've got $10 billion to spend. And instead of saying, okay, I'm going to put $5 billion aside and, and use the $5 billion to acquire people, they just took the whole 10 and bought people and right. didn't worry about, you know, I think that's, you know, I think that's where things didn't help, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and to your point, because maybe sometimes people don't think about this, right? Like, you know, having a big chunk of money where you're paying 2% on versus where you're paying 7% on you know, in terms of loans and stuff is a big oh, difference, yeah. right? So like, you know, that's yeah. had an impact on some of that stuff. Oh, too. absolutely. Well, when you when your entire, you know, game development uh, budget is based on you going to a bank and borrowing huge sums of money to right. to do new IP and suddenly that cost of money is like you said, doubled or tripled, um, then you 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 have to make smaller bets. You have to borrow less money and make smaller bets, and right. and that's why you see a lot of uh, you know the big publishers sticking with the tried and true games that they know are going to produce uh, you know uh, uh, revenue streams that they they know they can count on. And, and why wouldn't you do that? Right. Right. And so um, yeah, so, they, but that being said, is you know I think the industry, like I said, you, you know to to grow the industry, you need to start taking more risks, right? And, and whether it's new game ideas or new mm -hmm. IP, that's where I think we're, we're, what we're going to see, like I was talking about earlier, that's where I think the industry is eventually going to come to the realization, hey, we still need to take risk here, right? right. And that, yeah, yeah. that benefits, you know, like people like me and obviously developers my size or, or even smaller are the guys who are employing the vast majority of everyone in our industry, right? It's, right. you know, so. Yeah. Yeah, you you can't just forever milk those evergreen I, IPs, right? Well, everyone's going to get sick and tired of it. You're right. going to see consumers right. are going to go, oh my god, I'm going to play this again. Like, right. like it's cool, one, I'm excited yeah. about it. I love this, but you know, I mean, people get sick of doing the same thing over again. I'm, yeah, you know, but I still think that a lot of those games are awesome. Like, you know, um, you know, would I as a studio want to go work on some of those big games? Of course, I would. You know, yeah. but uh, 
but at the end of the day, I think, you know, we still, as an industry, we need to find new IPs like the Fortnites of the future or the, mm-hmm. you know, you name it. Those kinds of games where they're going to change the industry or the Grand Theft Autos or whatever, you know. Yeah. We need more franchise building opportunities that today don't exist. Those franchises need to be born and then they need to be created. And the only way that's going to happen my feeling is that a lot of that's going to be born and bred out of developers like us, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Have time, have an idea, and they're going to try and figure out a way to make it happen. And then, yeah, there's a lot of great ideas out there. And the problem is there's not a lot of money. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and unfortunately I I think some of those IPs I was talking about, the Fortnites of the future, somebody's got it. Somebody saw it and said, Oh, you know, right. like, I don't want to spend the money on that right now because, you know, my budgets are thin. And they might have walked away from the biggest thing since sliced bread, but that's yeah, just the way right. it is right now, you know? Yeah. So. yeah. You know, what's the biggest um, threats you see right now besides, you know, budgets being scaled back and stuff like that? Yeah, I think saying? there's opportunity and there's and there's there's concern, you know, so, mm-hmm. you know, in in the West, meaning the U.S., um, there's like I said, there's downward price pressure, which is concerning, you know, for developers like ourselves. Yeah, um, we are finding ways to solve that problem. We have very unique ways of solving that. We realize that, um, you know, in a studio like us, we typically have to have really senior people because mm-hmm. that's what a lot of the the people who ask for our help want, they want somebody to come in and fix the problems. Right. Yeah. And they don't want to have to train up juniors. But what we realize is that a lot of the juniors, people out of college that um, can really be effective quickly is um, by training them and getting them up to speed quickly. Yeah. And so, Wrapping them up. you know, we've talked a lot about internally about, you know, bringing in those more junior type, you know, talent and bringing them through our organization to get them to a point where they are extremely competent and, you know, they're acting like mids and seniors, even though they're, you know, they're, they're just, you know, they're juniors. Right. Uh, that's Probably. the type of stuff that can help with cost structures. Obviously, looking at, you know, like we have, we have multiple studios around the, around the world. Um, that allows us to, you know, pull talent from different places around the world. Mm-hmm. Um, all very, very experienced people and, and in some cases, you know, junior people too. Yeah. Uh, but those are the, some of the problems that a lot of developers in the U.S. have, have got to solve right now is how do we... How do we be cost effective so that we're still appealing to the publishers that have the uh, opportunities that are out there um, yeah. and, you know, still be, you know, a voice for those types of services? Because right now, like I said, a lot of publishers like, you know, I want to go do it super cheap. And I, like I said, I think that's going to rebound on them to some extent. Right. So, yeah, yeah. You know, you know I'm, I'm hoping that the adage, age old adage of you get what you pay for. Pay for uh, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a, yeah. don't get me wrong. There's some amazing studios in South America. There's some amazing studios in Eastern Europe or sort of even the Pacific Rim regions and, you know, areas where, um, mm-hmm. you know, there's amazing game developers in those areas that are extremely talented, um, you know, and, and we're always working with those types of people when we can. Um yeah. So you can have it cheap and still have really high quality development. So they can both go together. Um, but we have to make ourselves in the West, you know, uh, we have to make ourselves, you know, we have to make ourselves relevant. And and and, and you have to, so you got to mm. figure out a way to combine those forces together. And which is why we have this sort of distributed sort of uh, development mentality where we will pull yeah. from our different locations to put together teams that are cost effective as well as super talented, you know? Mm-hmm. So just kind of pivoting, like what are your thoughts on, you know, AR, VR, mixed reality, stuff like that. Sure. Like, I'm always kind of curious. I still about. think, you know, it's funny you say that my son is probably upstairs right now playing uh, gorilla tag, but um, <laughs> quest two, yeah. right? quest three. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think VR is, you know, I think they're just starting to get traction on some killer apps, mm-hmm. especially with the, the, the young kids. And I think that's great. Cause I think that was sort of, you know, five years ago, we were all scratching our head going, what's the, when are we going to get this killer app in VR? But I do think it's starting to happen. Um, I think augmented reality 
there is absolutely going to be something there. I mean, it only makes sense that that may eventually be part of or replace the phones at some point right. or another, or be, uh, you know, a part of the phone, however mm-hmm. you want to look at it. Um, right. I, I think there's something there. There's apps, there's a whole ecosystem, I think, um, with augmented reality that hasn't yet. I think the, te- I think the hardware needs to get there. Right. Cause right now it's yeah. so expensive. Um, but once it gets to a point where it's really, you know, like a phone, I think I think it's going to be huge a- AR specifically and mixed mm. reality you know because mixed reality in AR kind of one yeah, of the same kind of overlap. Yeah, right. you know um, I, I think there's huge potential there absolutely enormous if you can because you know obviously with VR the big problem that you've always had is like motion sickness and all right, that kind of stuff. right yeah. um, you know and, and I think with AR and mixed reality you don't really have that too much um mm. and being able to walk around the world and have the world come alive around you i think and and millions of ways that we can't even imagine is certainly i think there's something there absolutely yeah yeah to, to, yeah, to be able to see your environment and not feel claustrophobic and yeah or you know, you know like frame the rate wall comes that. alive in a in who knows right you know what yeah. i mean yeah so. there's lots of cool things going on in that space yeah absolutely yeah, and then you know, for the sixty-four thousand dollars question, like, what are your thoughts on AI? Right, so that's always. I think always AI is super fascinating. Ask me in five years is sort of my response. I think <laughs> from the games from the games industry right now, there's some very compelling. There's a lot of AI popping up. There's so much money. And you say, oh, I have an AI app, then all these investors come running. They're right. Running. Yeah. And and I think you know the speed with which AI is improving is amazing yeah. um but you know as a studio you know we evaluate those technologies very frequently and we're still at a point now where it's just not where it needs to be to to really like you know make me a game and then push the button right. yeah, yeah it's not there i mean there are things that yeah AI does very well you know, absolutely, it's finding its way into our industry more than it ever has. Mm-hmm. But I think, you know, like I said, ask me in five years because of the speed with which it's changing is so rapid. But um, right now, human intervention is absolutely required yeah. in every aspect of AI, right? Mm-hmm. You can't just have one guy do 30 things. It's It still requires somebody who knows what's going on. Uh, that's in the engineering side and the art side, animation, yeah. you name it. It's it's getting good, but it always going to require some human intervention to clean it up because it's not perfect. You've seen the pictures with people with twelve fingers. Yeah, and, yeah, all that. You know, right? it, like, it's what? very cool and it's amazing and it looks cool when they solve that problem and problems like that where right. it does things unexpectedly. You know. Um, which is cool and scary all at the same time, <laughs> right? Like what right. made this thing think that was okay, you know? Yeah. Um, but obviously it's not a human. It can't look at something and go, that's not right, you know? Yeah. It yeah. just, you know, it doesn't know that yet. But w- when it figures it out and it can look at a picture like you and I do, then, okay, yeah, then let's, like I said, talk to me in five years. Who God knows where we're going to be. Right. Yeah, and for a lot of, for me, like... I- it's it's just like a tool, right? Like it's a thing that when you exactly. have questions about stuff, you plug it in, and you're like, oh wow, that's interesting. And yeah, you know, ChatGPT is a great, it, but yeah, you know, yeah. ChatGPT is a great example of a very highly functional. Like I use it all the time. Like uh, that's such a horrible. Like I'm I'm writing a letter to somebody. That's such a horrible letter. It's like uh, I'm all over. And then I, I'll give it to ChatGPT right. and say, write it professionally. And I get it back, and I'm like. Oh, wow, that's really great. Like, that's really useful, right? Right. Um, and I know that it does a lot of other things, don't get me wrong, but... No, right, but yeah, make it less formal, make it more formal, shorten yeah. that, you know, like you have a bio, you're like, throw it in there, you know, and it gets you 80, 90% of the way there sometimes. Yeah, you know? exactly. And and like yeah. I said, it will get there, you know, it's doing that with uh, programming tasks. It's taking these mundane... Yeah repetitive tasks that you do over and over and over again. And it's taking that out of the hands of the programmer and the programmer just says, go fix this for me. That's Mm -hmm. great. You know, I'd rather have him spending time on things that are not, you know, mundane because nobody wants to do that stuff. So boring stuff. Yeah. It does have a place in our industry. It will continue to always have a place in our industry. It'll never go away. But I don't think there's any, we should, you know, because there's also a lot of fear surrounding that about right. people losing their job and stuff like that. I, 
I don't think, you know, if I was an artist or if I was an engineer, I wouldn't look at this as like, this is going to take my job one day. Look at it the other way around and say, how do I learn how to use this stuff? Start learning it now because if you can speed up what you used to do by just taking some of those tasks that you used to do that took w- way too long right. and you're doing your job faster in shorter amounts of time, that's pretty good. And trust me, everyone at the production level and then the management, if you say like something that used to take me two weeks now takes me a week, that's really good. Right. Let's yeah. Yeah. You're that. compressing those timelines and stuff. Yeah. yeah. So of course it's right. going to be part of our industry and it will forever. Right. Yeah. Yeah, just embrace it and, and, and learn how to harness it and make yourself yeah. more efficient, you know, and better at what you do. Yeah, I think that's kind of like the healthy perspective to take. I think Not, it is, you know, you know, but, you know, we should always, you know, keep an eye on it. And, you know, we're yeah. not doing anything that's going to like, you know, we're not doing the the Terminator thing here. Right, so, right. Still yeah. In the games. Right. yeah. <laughs> uh, taking over the world shit. Um, yeah. So what's been uh, one of your favorite projects to work on? In the past? Yeah. I mean, there's been so many. I mean, I'm sure if you've been to our website, you've seen everything we've worked on. There's so yeah, many great, really great projects. But I think what broke us out as a studio would probably have to be the 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 Bioshock, um the Bioshock remasters that we did for 2K. Cause it was a, okay. a funny there's a little funny story there because when I got a call from the 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 VP of uh, production at the time, uh, John Schwanek, and he called me and he says, "Hey, we need to port because they we'd worked on Bioshock two and three with with uh, Irrational. Rational, yeah. And then you know they said, okay, we want to take all these games and put them into a single pack, and so we're going to port them to the new 4Ks that are coming out, the 4K PS, you know, I guess PS threes or PS fours, and uh, so we we need you guys to port them up so they work in these new 4K, which means you need to change the rendering. We just want you to do ports." And I looked at the game <laughs> we, we, when we finally got it to work. We got Bioshock One working and rendering at 4K, and it just looked horrible. Like right. it wasn't built it, for 4K, right? So I mean, like no, it was horrible. Like the columns looked like you know hexagons or octagons. It was it was just terrible. Like it totally ruined the because it was one of my favorite games. And, mm. and I'm like, man, it's just it's so horrible. And the lighting was terrible. And I'm like, wow, this is really a disappointment. So I told my guys. I said, all right, like, do me a favor for a month. I want you to spend a month. And, you know, the room when you come up, the bath escape, when you come in the first part of the, you know, you, you, you go into to the tower and mm-hmm. then you ride the bath escape down and then you come up into the actual Bioshock world under the underground, underwater. And yeah. I said, rebuild that room, do all the, the new modern lighting, you know, the volumetric fog, um, reflections in the water, all the stuff that 4K brought and, you know, that that Unreal, because it was an Unreal, I don't even think it was Unreal 2, I think it was, wow. yeah, I think it was just, I was just Unreal three, 2. But- Two. Okay. Yeah, no, yeah, I think it was two, and so we moved it to something that wasn't that, and and then rebuild all the geometry and do all the stuff, and um, and when we sent it over, I didn't tell Two K that we'd done this work, and so I was just waiting for the call, yelling at me, and just you know, to tell me we're fired. But I got a call, and and, and um, can I swear on air? <laughs> oh yeah, hell yeah, yeah. This so, is this is not so, uh, family friendly. So John calls me, and he's all, "What the fuck, Brad?" And I'm like, oh, <laughs> shit. And "I'm standing there, and I'm like, I'm waiting. I'm like, he's gonna fire us." He's all, "This is amazing," and I'm like, "Can you do this for all of these games?" I'm like, "Yeah, we can, John." And he goes, "He goes, it's gonna cost a lot more money, isn't it?" I'm like, "Yes, it's gonna cost a lot of money." <laughs> There's a lot of work to do that. Yeah, right? there's a lot of work because we had to. We ripped the guts out of the entire first game, Bioshock One. We rebuilt basically ninety percent of the game's geometry. Wow. Because there's so wow. many curved services. Imagine all the curved services. Right, added. right. And water. And all everything. the statues, all the characters, everything. So it was, uh, that was one of my favorite things. And that's when we kind of broke out, you know. Yeah. We went from, I think, 30 or 40 people to 155 in like six months. And we wow. just became, we became a big studio. And then when it shipped, it was like a huge success. 
um, the, the trilogy series. Super huge. UK loved me. They sent me on a trip because I'm a huge football soccer fan, and they sent me to an Arsenal game as a <laughs> thank you. And so I think that's where we kind of broke out. But there's yeah. been really great titles, like from Electronic Arts, you worked on The Sims, great mm-hmm. game. But Mass Effect, we did a similar kind of a thing with Mass Effect and the BioWare team. Those guys were amazing. Every single book guy that was on that bioware team we learned a lot from them uh, as a studio because they're just amazing studio Mm -hmm. but we've had a lot of studios like that that we've learned and we we've managed as a studio to sort of take in what i would say the good ether from all these studios the good things that they do and bring it in and incorporate it in our studio kind of um, you know, atmosphere and, and our ecosystem and our, you know, and the way that we build, you know, procedures and the way we go about development and then incorporated it. So we've taken the best of all of these studios over 14 years and put it into who we are today. And, yeah. and I think we've really gotten to be a pretty damn good studio, to be honest with you. So yeah. just want to keep it going. Just got to, got to ride this out, you know? And yeah. so. Well, that, yeah, that'd be, yeah, yeah, that'd be exciting too. Is being a fan of the series and and doing the trilogy and and seeing it with that well received, right? That had to be yeah, very it was yeah. rewarding. Well, and they they didn't tell me. I had to find out later, but apparently it was the, the best selling game they had, and I don't know how oh. many. Years. Yeah, right. so yeah. I wish I had negotiated a royalty agreement with them. <laughs> right. Yeah, we hit this threshold, and we get X per unit or something. You know. Yeah, yeah that would be great. But yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I was too naive at the time uh, to know that I could have done that. Right. So, but it helped you grow the studio, right? If, if you grew from that side. Absolutely. To that size, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, and then I think ever since then, I mean, we've had a couple dips, uh, mm-hmm. but we've always been around 100 people for, for okay. a long time. Yeah, yeah that's a good size. Um, what's a funny or odd story from working in the industry that you're comfortable or you feel like sharing? Oh, my God. I'm sure you get like Rolodex of them to go through. Look, when you're in 14 years in a, in a, in a developer like ours, mm-hmm. uh, you have a lot of funny stories. Both, most of them you're not legally allowed to talk about. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Right. The lawyers will come after me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was. Yeah, and in, in, in E3 too. Again, it was always about parties and stuff, and it was like in the oh, very the, beginning, you know, the it was Foo the Wild Fighters were playing, and yeah, oh, we got garbage was, playing at Microsoft for Xbox, and it yeah. was it was the games industry back in the in the middle to late nineties was a, just a party scene, you know, and yeah, and even the beginning there. of the nineties, it was just party, party, party. It was the Wild West, yeah. and. Uh, you know, people were were striking it rich, and you know, and uh, and our industry was just catching on fire. That's when it caught on fire, and uh, yeah, and I'd say the mid '90s, right after Windows '95 shipped, uh, I think it was. Mm-hmm. You know, things started really taking off. Um, yeah, and and well, and, it's, it, it, and not to detour real quick, but speaking of parties, I was there when uh, they had that huge party at Microsoft in the garage where they hired Guar. Um, to show Doom running on on uh, on Windows. No, actually, I'm taking it back. This is ninety five ninety six three point one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They were showing like it can run. You don't have to be in DOS. You can run it in in Windows. They had Guar, and there was like blood everywhere, and and you know fake blood, obviously. But you know, it's just like this big crazy <laughs> part. I'm like, what the hell is going yeah. on? You know, we're trying yeah. to demo. Uh, games for Viacom New Media, and we had a little kiosk, and I walked by, and Guar is out there with very, I won't get into like what was, what they were what they had on stage, but it was so yeah, it was industry's gotten a lot more <laughs> reserved yeah. and professional because it's right. such a big industry now. But yeah, we've yeah. grown up a bit too, right? Like this isn't yeah, like, okay. and for for better or worse, however you want to look right. at it, I think um, you know eventually when you get so big, obviously it becomes what I would say regulated in some way or another. Mm-hmm. And it makes it a little bit more difficult for new startups and new developers to sort of break into the industry. Cause it then becomes who, you know, you know, who, you know, back then it was just like, who's got content, you know, like I need content right, right. no matter where it came from today. It's who, you know, you know, not what, you know. And so that's difficult. I think for a lot of startups, you know, you got to, you got to have an inroad into getting into a publisher. You got to know somebody mm-hmm. to get a meeting even, you know, yeah, and, right. you know, so. 
Yeah, um, and if you go solo, you have to build an audience, and you have to have wish lists and Steam and all. Yeah, that Yeah, you want to do it that way. You know, yeah, right. And yeah, it, and that hard. works too. I mean, with the advent of like what you're doing, I mean, mm-hmm. you know, uh, streaming and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you can do it. It's been done, right? Yeah. And, and you've got the, you know, you've got uh, Fortnite with all the user generated content. Yeah. You've got yeah. Roblox. I mean, you know, there are a lot of ways to 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 expose your ideas for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That are absolutely unique, but uh, I think it is more difficult than it used to be for sure. You know. Yeah. So, yeah, I had Alex Seropian on the show, and he started a new studio just around user-generated content and building that in, you know, the Fortnite engine, right? And yeah. build, building these experiences in Fortnite um, because you have that player base there, and they're looking for new stuff within that ecosystem, within that world. So, you know, I think that's that's cool. Um, if you've ever been in Fortnite now, it's becoming like your phone where you... When you want to scroll through the game you want to play, there's like hundreds and hundreds. Oh, of, yeah. I yeah. haven't been in it in a long time, but okay. Yeah, it's, I played with my son the other day, and uh, and I'm old school. I'm like, let's play no build, you know, blah, 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 Fortnite, because I can't build with crap anyway. Yeah. So, right. You know, but it's cool. Everybody's modded in, in a lot of different ways. There's so many different ways to play that game now. It's very cool. So Yeah. Speaking of games, like, you know, what games are you playing right now that you're excited about like what jumps out what well like? i mean you know it, as you probably know being being a ceo i don't get to play as much as i'd right. like to. a lot yeah. of like looking at other games when we're doing evaluations for what we want to do internally i think the last game i played um that i really thought was amazing was starfield um mm, yeah. like I, I went all the way through it and i managed to get through it and probably three or four weeks um, where I got to the point where I get to make that, not to give a spoiler alert, spoiler alert, spoiler. Yeah. Beep, beep. yeah. Um, when you get to the end and you get to make the choice of whether or not you want to, you know, basically start the game over again, but transition mm-hmm. is, you know, this alternate, you know, race of people. Yeah. Um, and so I just thought it was a really cool game. You know, Bethesda is just knocking it out of the park. That was, yeah, such sure. a great game. Um, you know, they have a history of making really great games, obviously Fallout and whatnot. And yeah, you know, um, but they have really, really great games, and and that was just an extension of it. But I love the space aspect of it and the creating and mm-hmm. building your spaceships. And you know, it, I thought it was a really great game, so I enjoyed that. I mean, I love a lot of different kinds of games, but uh, I have to say that would be my my highlight at the moment that I played recently which isn't really recently i right. think yeah. maybe a year plus ago two years ago now yeah so. but, but, yeah but you, you know people get busy and they you, you, especially on console or you, you can't make that commitment like i'm gonna sit in this chair for three and a half hours and play this game right like yeah that's why I actually, so appealing yeah I, I i get all my my newest game information from my my 12 year old so <laughs> <laughs> Right. Have you seen this? No, I haven't. And then he shows me. I'm like, wow, that was pretty cool, right? So, you know. yeah, um, yeah. Is there anything I should have asked you about but didn't? Can't really think of anything. I really appreciate you asking me to talk on your show. I guess the one thing you know that that we did announce, though, I don't think you asked me, but you know, right now, what we're working on that I can tell you about mm-hmm. is uh, we're heavily involved with uh, Microsoft on. State of Decay 3, which was oh, announced, okay. I think it was a couple weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, maybe four. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're heavily involved with um, Undead Labs um, on State of Decay 3. We're pretty excited about that. We have a, a fairly large team working with them right now on that. Um, cool. Obviously, um, we just ended our engagement with Amazon on New World. Uh, mm-hmm. The Is it the Eternium? Uh, that they just launched. Oh, the big MMO, New Worlds or New World. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. Were, we were we were involved with them for years on that project, probably three, four years now. So we just ended their engagement there, mm-hmm. um, and so hopefully they get a little bump from that. Um, right, it, yeah, it is a great game. Yeah, it's a great game. Um, they just need a little bit bigger of an audience, and I think they're going to do fine because it is a good game. It's just. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the you know, with any MMO, you need a big audience, you know. Uh, tons of content, too, right? Like, you, you know, it's just, I always just kind of, like, shake my head because, you know, a lot of times people are like, oh, look at all the money you can make 
in the MMO space, you, you know, and I'm like, and look at all the dead bodies, right? Like, look at yeah. all the companies that are like, oh, that's easy money, right? You know, and just ask Chris Schilling, you, right? Like, you well, can, how, how you can do out? it. You yeah, know. you can do it. Um, because it was a good game. I mean, there's no doubt about it that yeah. New World was a really cool game. And I think that, you know, as with any MMO, is like people want people play what it is that you've done. Yeah. And like, okay, cool, what's next, right? You know, right, and so right. like keep, everybody keep wants to gobble right. up the content. And if you don't right. get on that content wheel um, soon, especially with MMOs, because they're so big, right? And you got to right. so get on the content wheel. You, you need to have a pretty big content team. Um, yeah. I think, you know, I think, you know, that's where a lot of guys fall short. Because you need to get on that content wheel and you need to have content updates and it can't be, you know, every six months or every year. It needs to be more frequent than that. Right. And, right. And um, and I think that's just the nature of the way the kids are today is, you know, with YouTube, it's like, gee, you know, oh, that's interesting. So the short attention spans, you know, yeah. like they did everything. OK, now what? Let's move on. Right. And to keep them engaged, you got to keep that content wheel going. Right. So, right. Right, and that costs money, and you have to be able to scale it, and um, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's not easy, right? Yeah, yeah. you got it. So, I mean, but it, I thought it was a great game. We we were heavily involved with mm -hmm. them. Um, you know, we were the we were the team that did all the console porting uh, for them, and mm -hmm. so um, and we did a lot of of the creature development for them, and and a lot of other things in the world too. So. Um, yeah. Yeah, we're pretty excited about our involvement with them. It's unfortunate that, you know, we had to end our engagement just because I think that once the consoles were released, they were going to decide what they're going to do next. And I think we just hit that, hit the end of the road there. Right. So, yeah, but it sounds like you got some other irons in the fire and, you know. Oh, absolutely. We're, we're fine. Game's gone. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So where can people find you online, you know, in terms of social yeah, websites, so, I mean, stuff like that? Yeah, so I mean, obviously, we have a website, and you can go to blindsquirrelgames dot com. Um, I think our it does redirect to Blind Squirrel Entertainment, which is our um, our official holding company name. Um, okay. Um, so blindsquirrelentertainment dot com is our website. Yeah. Uh, we're all, you can find us on LinkedIn as well under um, Blind Squirrel as well on mm -hmm. Instagram at Blind Squirrel Games. Uh, and on X, X, you know, Twitter or X, yeah, or yeah, right. At blind underscore under underscore squirrel underscore. <laughs> That's hard yeah. to say real fast. Underscore, um, underscore, yeah, yeah. So each word underscore, right? Like so, yeah. Yeah, blind yeah. at blind underscore squirrel underscore. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, and just kind of like the last question, like what's one piece of advice you have give others working in the industry right now? You know, for, I think it's, it's, it's all, it mirrors a lot of what I've been saying is, you know, yep. it's, you know, we got to all <laughs> hold hands and sing Kumbaya and get through this together. Um, right. You know, I think. Survive I think the storm more, here. Yeah. Yeah, kind of. I mean, you know, like I said, I can't tell you how many, I've been in several panels where it's like survive 25 or you know, or, you know, and, and that's like a, one of the most common themes you can see at any kind of talk right now is survive 25. And, mm -hmm. and I think, I think there's some truth to that, you know, um, band together, you know, 25 or 24 or, or, or 24, yeah. sorry, yeah. survive yeah. till 25. Sorry. Yeah. To make it, to, make it to 25. Okay. Make it yeah. to 25. Yeah. Everybody right. make yeah. it. Let's get across the fish line together. Yeah. Um, but you know, it, it is sort of kumbaya for those that are, you know, affected by the layoffs, you mm -hmm. know, um, do everything you can. There, there are still people that are hiring. You know, most of them are bigger companies right now. I think a lot of the smaller companies, um, especially in the West, uh, are waiting for the publishers to sort of turn that spigot back on. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, learn as much as you can. Never be sort of don't pigeonhole yourself and if you're an artist or an engineer don't pigeonhole yourself into only doing one thing try to be open to learning a lot of different things it makes you a better employee you know mm -hmm. in general it makes you more valuable harder to let go in an event something yeah. like this you're more versatile happen yeah. because you're like well we can he can still do this that and the other right you know, or she can do know. this or do that and yeah he yeah, or she, yeah i'm sorry yes and yeah. so um you know or they you know yeah. so um you know at the end of the day um 
you know, just stay, stay diligent. It's going to get better. Like I said, you know, mm-hmm. I think a lot of the, you know, a lot of people in my position, we sit in those rooms with the big publishers and we hear the same thing over and over again is, is right now, you know, things are tough and we're, you know, really tightening our purses. That's what we've heard for the last two years. So right. we knew this coming I mean, two years ago when we started getting these meetings and it was starting to happen. We started saying, hey, this isn't normal. Right. And, you know, I think we're at the tail end of that now. So mm-hmm. I think that as we move into 25, later into 24, being in 25 and probably all the way to the end of 25 is we're going to start seeing that change. Uh, and I think people are going to start coming back into work. So <laughs> survive until 25. 25 right. Right. Yeah. So, um, you yeah. know, stay, stay with it. Check, check websites, check our website uh, yeah. on our creators page, check mm-hmm. any, you know, mo- there's a lot of great uh, websites that actually post available jobs, um, depending yeah. on, on uh, what you do. Um, you know, but, uh, a great aggregator I should share and, grackle hq with a g and it's just it every every role in the world um is it's a you know it's a big aggregator so they scrape all these game companies all the time on their job postings and it's all centralized and you can type in you, you know character artist or or producer or whatever and then it'll just list all the companies and you could sort by you know north america or us or europe or cool. by countries and it's just like this uh, i interviewed a game designer once a couple of years ago and she told me about it. i was like wow this is amazing it's all just like in one spot um yeah. so, so so grackle hq you know i think is, is super helpful for people looking and then it's like you know make that resume sharper have the link to your portfolio you know improve your portfolio you know all these kind of things to um stand out more and be more marketable um yeah i mean exactly and then and then for those of you know the people that got laid off you know um you know if you're if you're on linkedin and you used to work with them you know having Mm -hmm. your peers say hey this guy was really he was awesome, you know, supporting each other. Um, yeah, you know, recommendations, you know, best, stuff like that. He or she or they were the best animator I've ever seen, right. you know, whatever, right? And, you know, help each other out. Because um, that's what we need right now is we're we're all in this, but we're, we're a pretty small industry in right. terms of total number of people. Um, yeah, yeah. So, and, yeah. you know, that means we have a very a very small but highly skilled set of people, some of which are unemployed right now. And some of some people are lucky enough to still be employed. Mm-hmm. Um, we all need to pull together because the wave that comes after this in 2025, I'm hoping that we'll grow that industry and everyone that's in it. Cause that's how it works. You gotta, if yeah. you're going to grow the industry, the dollar, the people don't stay the same. They have to grow along with the dollars. Mm-hmm. So that means that we will see growth with people as well moving right. into the future. Right. Yeah. And, and adapt and learn new things and yeah. look at different business models and figure out how to grow and, and, and ride the wave. Right. So, yeah. Absolutely. Well, cool. Well, thank you, Brad, so much for being on tonight. I, I really yeah. Enjoyed well, this. Thank you. I really appreciate it.